the question is, saved by faith alone, you've been lied to. And so many people in the religious world hold to the faith only salvation. Right, we hear it a lot. I don't have to give quotes. You know what they teach. By that, what we mean is that you know, all one has to do to be saved from their sins so that they may inherit eternal life and the joys of heaven forever and ever. All you have to do is merely believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Savior, the Son of God. That's it. All right, that's your salvation. It's as simple as that. We can all go home and pack up and see it. If you believe in Christ, take his punch. The teaching says that by your mere mental assertion that, yes, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. By that assertion and that thought, your soul is saved. In, in that sense, they say a man is saved by faith alone. Faith only. Don't put obedience into this discussion. Don't put your lifestyle into this topic. Don't talk to me about repentance or your love for God. Belief is it. And your sins are covered. Right? Rejoice, you've been saved. That's what a lot of people teach. And then they go on to say, now that your sins have been taken care of because you believe because you believe in Christ, it's now up to you if you would like to pursue Jesus any further. You know, it's up to you if you'd like to continue worshiping God. It's up to you if you'd like to continue following His commandments, teaching His will. It's completely up to you. But hey, don't feel like you have to. Because you don't have to. And they say, if you don't so choose to live faithfully, no harm done. Because Christ had you covered no matter what. Just as long as you believe he's Christ. So do you understand that this is what a lot of people in the religious world believe and teach? What is the result of this teaching? I believe a society who does not take sin seriously before God. The people who believe that there are no consequences for their action. Because, hey, I'm still, I'm still going to heaven. I punch my ticket, now I get to live how I want. No consequences. We have a generation of Bible believers with no respect for God's authority. And then that teaches them not to have respect for authority elsewhere. And that's what's wrong with our Christian society, so to speak. And they say, yes, I understand that God says that. I understand what the Bible says, but... If I don't choose to follow his ways, I'm, I'm still going to heaven because I believe in Jesus. So it really makes no difference. And that's the mentality that a lot of people have about Christianity. And let me just make a simple statement about this doctrine. This doctrine is really one of the biggest delusions that mankind has ever seen. There's not a word of truth to it, that it is by belief. Alone. You know, somehow Satan has fooled the religious world. You know, they, 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 Satan knew that he couldn't get Jesus completely out of the picture, but he's like, I, I know what I can do. I'm going to ruin their doctrine. I'm going to make them think they're saved before they're actually saved, and then they're going to go through their life unsaved. Somehow Satan has fooled the world into thinking that belief in Christ is the only ingredient to the salvation pie, if you will. They, they, they believe... Um, you know, faith is the only word involved in describing man's salvation process. All you have to do is believe. Now, I've used this illustration before, and I'd like to revisit it. Because I think that this will help us uh, get this word. I don't know if you remember this illustration. I think this will help us in, in dealing with this question, helping people to see and understand. I want you to imagine that you are making a batch of chocolate chip cookies. Very simple task. You understand that in making chocolate chip cookies, there are several different ingredients involved in the process. All of them are necessary for successful make making of chocolate chip cookies. All of them are important. And if you're going to successfully follow the recipe of chocolate chip cookies, here are the items that you're going to need. You're going to need butter. Man, that's important to chocolate chip cookies. You're going to make sure you need to have that. You're going to have to have sugar. You need eggs, flour, baking soda, vanilla or vanilla extract, chocolate chip cookies, and you're going to need that dash of salt that my mom says is so important. 
Now we understand the importance of all of these ingredients and the recipe of chocolate chip cookies. All of them play a vital role in the whole picture, in the whole recipe. Now sometimes you'll pull the cookies out of the oven, you'll taste them, you'll realize, I left something out. You'll go back and check, man, I forgot to put the baking soda, or I put too much baking soda. Forgot the butter. Why is this all crumbling? Where's the eggs? And you realize that you missed something. You missed a vital ingredient. Because you know, each ingredient makes up the whole. Now I want, you, I want you to imagine with this illustration that I come up to you one Sunday morning during service or before services, and I'm just as happy as can be. And I say, man, I want you to know I, I baked you some chocolate chip cookies. They're in my car. I'm going to give them to you after the services are over. So what are you doing throughout services? You're thinking, man, Travis has some cookies for me. I'm excited to get my cookies. What would you think if after the services were over, if I came up to you and said, all right, here's, here's your chocolate chip cookies that I promised you, and I hand you a bowl of eggs? <laughs> what would you do? Or if I stuck in your hand a stick of butter and said, here's your cookies that, that I promised, or a bag of chocolate chips, you take one of them. You know, what would be your reaction if I gave you one of the ingredients and claim that it was the whole thing. Now you probably think either A, Travis is crazy, or B, he's just messing around with me. And then you'd be upset because I didn't really give you chocolate chip cookies, did I? So that's the concept. We understand this idea of several different ingredients making up the whole recipe. Well, do you understand that that's the same thing with the Bible's description throughout the New Testament of man's salvation? <laughs> It is a recipe. You see different things in different places talking about the importance of the butter and the, the importance of the vanilla. And sometimes it, it, they'll, they'll focus on that one ingredient and that one item. Now, there are several different spots in Scripture that talk about how belief in Christ is an all-important ingredient in mankind's salvation. Oh, man, this is important. You can't have salvation if you don't believe in Christ. You must believe that He's the Savior of the world. You must believe that he's the Son of God. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6 says, But without faith, without that belief and that foundation that you believe that Jesus is the Messiah, without it, it is impossible to please him. Man, it's, it's important. But what I want to show in this lesson is that belief alone, by itself, is by no means the only thing that Scripture says saves us. It is not the only Ingredient, you know, belief in Christ, as important as it is, is not the only ingredient necessary for you to go to heaven. And let us never make that claim. That's by belief alone, it's by faith alone. Don't even say that it's by grace alone. None of these things stand alone if you don't have the whole recipe, if you don't have the whole picture. So what I have in this lesson for you, and what I'm going to stick in your hand as you leave tonight, is a list of 25 different ingredients if you will. It's actually a list of 25 passages. Different items that Scripture says saves us. And all of these different things that Scripture comes right out and says, this saves you, this saves you, this saves you, is all part of the recipe. And only one of those ingredients is belief in Christ. It's important, yes. It's necessary, but it's not the only ingredient. Some of these ingredients that we're going to talk about tonight Refer to what God has provided for us in the scheme of redemption. Things that God has done. Things like grace, mercy, love, truth, the word of truth, right? Items that can be credited to God. If it wasn't for God doing his part in the recipe, you'd have no hope. So it started with, with God's part of the recipe. And these are things that we can't take credit for. But then there are other things on this list we're going to talk about. That talks about man's duty to God in salvation. And you have been given a task if you wish to receive salvation. God's offered it, and you have to do it in faith. We're going to talk about words like obedience and faithfulness, repentance, baptism, and many other things. And what I'm going to show is that faith is not the only command for salvation. That's not what you see in Scripture at all. But... There are other actions that we must do in faith which would save us. And if your faith is a saving faith, it's going to lead you to obey. You can't separate your faith and works of obedience. Right? The Bible does not separate them. You must have both. So here they are, 25 essential ingredients to man's salvation. 
Number one, the Bible says a man is saved by hope. Romans chapter 8, verse 24, Paul says, For we were saved in this hope. Now this hope, no doubt, comes about because of God. He's provided us a way of salvation when no one else could. And we live by faith, and we live in this hope that God's provided us with for eternal life. Paul says that hope saves us. We are saved in that hope. Number two, man is saved by grace. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. This is obviously God's part. This is a very important part that you wouldn't have salvation if you didn't have this key ingredient. For by grace you can save through faith. And not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Grace. You know, we're, we're saved because God did something for us that He didn't have to do. Something that we could not do for ourselves. You couldn't save yourself, could you? you know, it, it, it's something that we did not deserve, something that we will never deserve. It's because of that extended grace that a Christian can be saved. Next one, the man is saved. Number three, Scripture says man is saved by faith. So we're talking about this lesson. You can remember back to what we just read. For by grace you've been saved through what? Through faith. And not of yourselves. You know, so it is through it is through faith that we have access to that grace. Romans chapter 5, verse 2. And so in Acts chapter 16, verse 31, we see that belief in Christ is also is essential. So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. You and your household. So the process of salvation begins by accepting that Christ is the Messiah. Right? No one is denying this all-important step of salvation. You must go through Jesus Christ if you want to go to heaven. If you want to have your sins washed away, if you want to get back to the Father, you've got to go through Jesus. What's John chapter 14, verse 6 say? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Or you want to get to the Father in heaven, you're going to have to take my way. You're going to have to take my salvation. And so we're saved by faith in Christ, absolutely. Number four, the Bible also says that man is saved by mercy. Titus chapter 3 and verse 5. Paul writes, it says, not of works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. Number five, man is saved by words. Acts 11 verse 14. Peter recounts the angel's instruction to Cornelius back in chapter 10. And the angel said to Cornelius, Send men to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, but you need to go and find Simon, who will tell you words by which you and all your household will be saved. And so we, we know that Cornelius then heard those words, believed those words, believed in Christ, and then obeyed them unto salvation. Man is saved by coming into contact with God's words. Number six, man is saved by the word. James chapter 1 and verse 21 says, Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness. Right? Put those things aside and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to one, which is able to save your soul. So the word given by God has eternal life in it. It's the answer for our sins. It's able to save our souls. It's an important ingredient we need to understand. Number seven, man is saved by receiving the truth. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 10. It says, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish. Why? Why did they perish? Because they did not receive the love of the truth that they, they might be saved. Right, so we learn that, that these individuals that Paul is talking about perished because they did not receive the truth. They didn't have a love for the truth. They rejected it, and so they wouldn't receive it. There's that truth that has been sent from heaven, and they would not accept it. They would not receive it, so they perished. Therefore, man is saved when he chooses to receive that truth. So we're saved by receiving the truth. Number eight, man is saved, the Bible says, by obedience. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 9. It says, talking about Jesus, that having been perfected, Jesus became the author of eternal salvation to who? To all who obey him. To all who obey him. According to this passage, who is Christ's salvation for? The obedient. Right? Those who receive the truth of Jesus Christ and obey it will be washed from their sins. 
And it's a gift that God has given to all men, saying, hey, if you would like this, you can have it. But Christ is going to only save those who receive it and those who obey it. What about 1 Peter? Uh, chapter 1, verse 22 on this topic. Peter makes this statement to Christians. He says, Since you have purified your souls and obeyed the truth through the Spirit and sincere love of the brother, and love one another fervently with a pure heart. So he's telling them, you need to love each other. But did you catch that phrase at the beginning? It says, Since you have purified. So you did what to your souls? You purified your souls. And how did you do it? When you obey the truth. And so what we learn here is that it is our decision whether or not we allow God to purify our soul. We, we, get to, we get to choose if we want the cleansing or not. You don't have to take it. So God has provided the atonement to purify your soul, but it is your choice if you would like to be washed by it. Now, how does one make that choice? To uh, be, be washed, to be cleansed, to be purified? The verse says, by obeying the truth. You have to obey now, there's a difference between just believing and obeying. Can't you see? Can we see that? Can we point that out to people? There's a big difference. You know, Peter said that they had been purified when they obeyed. <coughs> what about uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 to 9? Paul talks about the judgment scene, or the judgment day scene, what's going to happen. He talks about when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God, and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. So, here's the question according to this verse. Who, on that day, is going to receive condemnation and separation from God forever? Who is it going to be? Well, the verse very simply says that it's those who do not know God and those who do not Obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So let, let's ask the question, can a soul believe in Jesus Christ but not obey the gospel? You better believe that that's possible. You certainly can. There are many people in the world who believe that Jesus is a Savior, but they have not accepted and not, have not obeyed the gospel. They've not done anything to change their life. Some people act like you can just go live however you want to because they have believe in Jesus. But the Bible says that man is saved by obedience the gospel. Only those who, who know God and obey the gospel are going to get to go to heaven on that day. So we're saved by obedience. Uh, number nine, I'm going to read this one just for sake of time. Man is saved by the gospel. That's that message. First, or first Corinthians 15 2. Number ten, man is saved by belief in Christ. We see it, we've seen this already. John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but should have everlasting life. Now let's pair that <clears throat> ingredient with the two ingredients talked about Mark 16, 16. Man is saved by belief and baptism. You see two ingredients in this one. When Jesus said, he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. So let me get this straight. John 3, 16 talks about how a man must believe in Christ. And now you come over to Mark 16, 16, and Jesus says that man must believe and be baptized for salvation. Now let me just ask you, is that, is that a contradiction? Because Jesus, Jesus talks about specifically one ingredient over here, and then over here he talks about two at the same time. Is that a contradiction? Absolutely not. Just because you add to the different ingredients together, you know, both are necessary. Let me give you an illustration of this language. Parents, let me say, let, let's imagine that you're going to ask your child this question. I guess you give them this option. Say, honey, if you spread your bed, if you spread your bed and pick up the floor, I'm going to take you to Chuck E. Cheese. Now what happens if that little kid, your child, spreads their bed, but they do not pick up the floor? Well, sorry, no Chuck E. Cheese, right? Well, why not? You know, did they did they do it? You said. You said, hey, if, if you if you will spread your bed, if you will pick up the floor, I'll take you to Chuck E. Cheese. Two conditions listed with the conjunction and. 
It's that simple. You say, well, well no, I, I told them to spread their bed and pick up the floor. Mark 16, 16, it works the same exact way. Right? Two important ingredients to man's salvation. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. Shall receive forgiveness. Right? That's what he's talking about. So we have to understand the language here. We can talk about one over here. Sometimes it just talks about baptism. Sometimes it just talks about repentance. You know, just because we focus on one of the ingredients in a different section doesn't mean that it excludes the other. You have to put the whole recipe together. We have to understand that and show people that. What about number 12? The Bible says man is saved by belief and confession. So John 3.16 says belief. Mark 16.16 16 says belief and baptism. Now this one talks about belief and confession. Romans 9.10. Says that if, if you I'm sorry, says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You know, what two ingredients are specified here? Belief and confession. Believe, confess, you'll be saved. Let's talk about the different ingredients involved. Number 13, man is saved by repentance, the Bible says. Luke 13, 3. Jesus said the statement, I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And so Jesus gives two options. Either you repent or you perish, right? What does that mean? That only those who repent will be saved. So can you believe in Jesus Christ without repenting? Absolutely. So you can't have just belief alone. Because repentance is involved as well. Number 14, man is saved by repentance and baptism, Acts 2.38. Says so then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So, what two conditions do we see specifically listed in, in this context for the forgiveness of sin? Well, Peter said repentance and baptism. For what reason? For the forgiveness of your sins. So there's two, there's two that it talks about in that context: repentance and baptism. Number 15, man is saved by belief, confession, and baptism. You see that in Acts chapter 8, verses 35 through 39. It says, Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. It's all it said. He preached Jesus to him. We don't know if he talked for 10 minutes. We don't know if he talked for 4 hours. But he preached Jesus. And the next thing you see in verse 36 is, Now as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, See, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? You know, and we know what he's saying, right? We know what he's asking. Well, what is hindering me right now from being saved? What does he say in verse 37? So then Philip said, If you believe, oh, there's belief. If you believe with all of your heart, then you may. And he answered and said, I believe. That Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Well, what's that called? That's a confession. If you believe, you can. I, I believe. I, and now I confess. So let's see what happens next. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. He immersed him, right? Now verse 39 says, Now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, so the eunuch saw him no more, right? Philip left, and he went on his way rejoicing. So th this is the story of the eunuch obeying the gospel. The eunuch heard the words of God and understood that what he needed to do to be saved, right? He preached Jesus to him. So that eunuch went down into the water that day, having put the old man of sin to death and buried that old man of sin in baptism. Romans chapter 6 and verse 4 says the sinners are buried with him through baptism into death. Right, where, where is his blood located in his death? It says, we're buried with him through baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. Right, so the eunuch rose up that day out of the watery grave of baptism, we might say, having his sins washed away, ready to walk in newness of life, faithful unto death. That's obedience to the gospel. And the eunuch went on his way rejoicing because why? Did you do rejoice if you're not saved? No, you rejoice when you're saved. He comes out, out of the water, didn't see Philip, had to go, 
And now he goes on his way rejoicing because he is saved. And the baptism, after his obedience to the gospel, uh, washed away his sin. So we read of belief, confession, baptism, in Acts chapter 8. Number 16. We see that man is saved by baptism. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21. The text says, There is also an antitype which now saves us. Mm. Belief. No, oh, wait, I'm sorry. I, admit, I misread that. There is also an antitype which now saves us. Baptism. Baptism. Acts chapter 22, and verse 16. You remember what Ananias said to Paul? He said, Now, why are you waiting? You know, he had been praying on the road after he'd been blinded. He had already confessed that Jesus was Lord. He certainly believed in the Lord. He said, Why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sin, calling on the name of the Lord. So, baptized, washed away sin, calling on the name of the Lord. Number 17, man is saved by calling on the name of the Lord. That's how he does it. That's how man, man does it, as we, we see Paul did. Romans chapter 10, verse 13. It says, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So can you believe that Jesus is the Christ without calling on him for salvation? Yeah, you can. There's a lot of people who believe in Christ, but they never tried to call on him for salvation. Acts chapter 2, and verse 21, says, And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Right? It's not excluding all of these other things. It's the same picture. It's the same recipe. If you call on the name of the Lord by obeying the gospel, you're going to be saved. You are going to be saved. Number 18, the Bible says that man is saved by the washing of regeneration. Titus chapter 3 and verse 5. Paul says, we read this look at mercy earlier, but he says, Not of works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Is this perhaps a reference to what takes place spiritually at baptism? I believe so. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25, Paul talks about Christ's relationship to the church. Remember that section very well. It says, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with what? With the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Right? So he would sanctify the church and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. Doesn't that make sense? Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22, talks about having. Our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And it's all through the, the New Testament. What about number 19? Man is saved by being born of water and of the Spirit. John 3, verse 5. Jesus said in that uh, section, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is what? Born of water and the Spirit. So if you think about that, you you know, we, we preach baptism, but we also preach repentance. We also preach being born of the Spirit. It says, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Some people take just the Spirit, they take the water out of it. You don't have salvation. And thus, we see that man is saved by being born of water and born of the Spirit. That means being truly converted with your Spirit, being conformed to Christ. Sometimes we just go down in the water, we get wet, and we live the rest of our lives like a heathen. We're not saved. Okay, you have to be born of the water and of the Spirit. You have to change your life. It's a conversion. It's a change. And you'll be saved. Number 20. Man is saved, the Scripture says, by being faithful unto death. Revelation 2 and verse 10. It says, be faithful unto death. And that, you know, even unto the point of death. Be faithful and I'll give you the crown of life. And so how do I ensure, according to this passage, that I receive the crown of life? I need to be faithful. Let me ask you a question. Does that mean I need to be perfect? No. But I need to be faithful. There's a big difference. We need to be faithful unto death. Faithful to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm going to go through these next ones pretty quick. Number 21, man is saved by God. John 3, 17. Man is saved by Jesus, Matthew 1, 21. 
Man is saved by the Holy Spirit, 2 Thessalonians 2, 13 and 14. Man is saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, Romans chapter 5, verse 9. That verse says, much more than having now been justified by his blood. What's justified mean? You're, you're going to be put right. And some people say, just as if I've not sinned. Justified, right? You're, now you've been justified. You've been put back where you needed to be by his blood. We shall be saved from wrath through him. So made right with God by his blood and we're justified. And number 25 on our list, the Bible says that man is saved by obedient works, not by faith alone. James chapter 2, verses 18 through 24. James writes, says, but some will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe there's one God? You do well. Even the demons believe. Man, that's a powerful statement. You, you think you're doing well because you believe? Satan believes. Demons believe. Are they saved? It says, and they tremble. They believe and tremble. Verse 20 says, But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Being long, right? Now keep in mind, when James talks about works in this section, we talk about this sometimes, he's talking about a different type of work, a different kind of work than Paul refers to in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. It's used in a completely different sense, right? Paul, when he talks about not works, let's say man should boast, he's talking and using it in the sense of works of human merit. James is referring to works of obedience, otherwise known as works of faith. So works of human merit, which Paul talks about, but doesn't save us, you know, human merit says, I'm going to follow my own goodness and save myself. Right? I'm, I'm going to do it alone. I'm going to do it without God, and I'm going to save myself. You're not going to be saved that way. But works of obedience says, I'm going to follow God's goodness, not my own, and I'm going to do what God told me to do to be saved. That's the difference between the two types of work.
to go to heaven when this life is over. And you get to inherit the wonders of heaven. It's going to be because of these two things. Number one, because God provided a way. And number two, because you took God's way. You did what he told you to do. What's that called? Faith. It's confidence. If you trust this message, if you want to do to save you, then you're going to do it. And all of these items are involved in Christ's salvation. This is how one responds to the gospel and obeys it. So we can't let people teach that belief in Christ is the only ingredient in salvation. So, saved by faith alone, tell the world you've been lied to. So if anybody needs to respond to heaven's message, if you need to make your life right, if you'd like to obey the gospel, we're ready to attend to, to you this hour. As we stand, as we sing.